Hello, hope you are doing well. Today I am going to take up a lesson from NCERT's English textbook for class 12. The name of the textbook is Flamingo and the name of the lesson is Poets and Pancakes. Lights, camera, action. We will begin the lesson now. It must be unusual for you to hear these words on camera today. But for media professionals, these words mean that the creative and technical crew should be ready to record. Today we will go behind the scenes and explore the world of a famous film company in India. The author Ashok Mitran chronicles the struggles and experiences of a film company that he himself was part of post-independence, Gemini Studios. Gemini Studios was founded in 1940 in Chennai by S. S. Vasan and grew to become one of the most influential centers of filmmaking in India. The excerpt that we shall be discussing today not only has literary significance for the psychological portraits that the author draws using subtle satire and light humor, the piece also has historical relevance because it presents an account of life in a film studio from a long time ago. Many cinema goers and archivists refer to such accounts to build a picture of places and people who may not find mention in mainstream history books. Let us now talk about Ashok Bitran. We must know about the author before we read the excerpt. Ashok Mitran was a Tamil writer who wrote hundreds of short stories, 20 novellas and 8 novels. He was awarded the Sahitya Academy in 1996 and was widely admired for his sensitive and insightful portrayal of middle class life in Indian cities. Born as Jagdisa Tyagarajan, he took the pen name Ashok Mitran when he began writing. The film industry appeared often in his works because of his intimate knowledge of life in a film company. In his early days, he worked in the publicity department of the Gemini Studios. His book, My Ears with Boss, details his experiences. Although he performed an insignificant function, he was one of the most well informed of all the members of the Gemini family. The excerpt that we shall discuss today is from the book, My Ears with Boss. Who is the boss? Can you guess? S. S. Vasan, of course. Notice these words and expressions in the text try to infer their meaning from the context. Now the words are they are given in your book also. If you open your books on page 57, you will find that these words have been given here. When you are reading the text and when I am discussing the text with you, make sure that you try to get the meaning of these words from the context. I will just read out the words, maybe I will come back to discuss the meanings. The first word is blew over, was struck dumb, catapulted into, a coat of mail, played into their hands, the favorite haunt, heard a bell ringing. I hope you have made a note of these words. Because getting the contextual meaning is very important. We come across many reading pieces in our life. We read the newspaper every day. We read film magazines. We do not rush to the dictionary every now and then. We try to get the meaning in the context. 
let us take a peek into Gemini Studios now. Are you ready to take a walk into the Gemini Studios along with Ashok Mitran? Let's get back to 1940s. Let's enjoy the journey. Ashok Mitran begins with telling us about makeup, an essential part of the show business. We all know that. Pancake was the brand name of the makeup material that used to come to the Gemini studios. It used to come in truck loads. He then mentions accomplished and celebrated female actors across generations to establish that the time period when the story is set. He writes, Greta Garbo must have used it. What? The pancake, that uh, makeup material, Miss Gohar must have used it. Vijanti Mala must also have used it. But Rati Agnihotri may not have even heard of it. Nowadays, we have many brands, but maybe at that time, pancake was the brand available because the things might have changed by then. Now, let us know a little about these actors. Greta Garbo was a Swedish female actor who was renowned for her beauty and acting skills. The Guinness Book of World Records named her the most beautiful woman ever lived and she also received an Oscar for her work. She worked in silent films. She is from that era. Then Miss Goha. Miss Gohar's full name was Gohar Khayyam Mamajiwala. She was a talented singer, actor, producer and founder of the Ranjit Film Studio in Mumbai. She worked in black and white films. Vijanti Mala. You all must be knowing about her. Vijanti Mala is a thespian with many accolades and awards to her credit. She was an extremely popular actor in South Indian and Hindi cinema. She is also an accomplished Bharatanatyam dancer and Carnatic singer. Of course, Rati Agnihotri, who does not know about her? She was a Hindi film actor who also worked in many popular films in South India. Her fans admired her for her impressive acting skills and natural beauty. At the very outset, it seems like the author is peeling off the layers of makeup. We are going to see the Gemini studio now metaphorically and he is peeling off the makeup of Gemini studios to reveal the true face of the film industry. He writes that the makeup department, of course, they had many departments over there. Gradually, we will come to know about all the departments, makeup department, story writing department, all of that. He writes that the makeup department of the Gemini studios was in the upstairs of a building that was believed to have been Robert Clive's stables. Let us go back to the times of Robert Clive, long back. Major General Robert Clive, also known as Clive of India, was the first British governor of the Bengal Presidency. He along with Warren Hastings laid the foundation of the British colonial rule in India. He first rose to prominence for defeating the French and establishing British control in southern India. So, you must have read about Robert Clive and Warren Hastings in history and if you are a student of history now, you must have read about them in detail. So, this building actually belonged to Robert Clive long back, hundreds of years back. A dozen other buildings in the city are said to have been his residence. With this description, the writer seemed to suggest that just as the British once controlled life in India, cinema 
now held a sway over the city. What a comparison. Earlier it was controlled by the British and now people were enamored by cinema. These days also cinema has influence on all of us. Ashok Mitran describes the studio in detail. The makeup room had the look of a hair cutting salon with lights at all angles, around half a dozen large mirrors. They were all bright lights, so you can imagine the fiery misery. Fiery misery. Underline these two words. What does this mean in the context of this lesson? This makeup scene. Fiery misery. Now, fr from where is the fire coming? The lights. Misery. You know, to put on so much of makeup is a misery. Now, he says, so you can imagine the fiery misery of those subjected to makeup. The makeup department was first headed by a Bengali who became too big for his studio and left. He was succeeded by a Maharashtrian who was assisted by a Dharwar, Kanadiga, an Andhra, a Madras Indian Christian, an Anglo Burmese, and the usual local Tamils. So, what do you understand from this explanation? There was national integration. All this shows that there was a great deal of national integration long before AIR and Doordarshan began broadcasting programs on national integration. He goes on to explain that makeup did not make the actors look beautiful. No, that is what we think. Rather, they looked hideous. Now, what is the meaning of hideous over here? Hideous means they looked horrible. They did not look pretty. It is interesting to read the description because he suggests that the makeup department was like a microcosm of India. Why microcosm of India? Because we had a Bengali, a Maharashtrian, an Anglo Burmese, a Kanadiga, a person from Andhra, Madras Christian, and Tamil people. So, it was microcosm of India. There was great diversity in the studio. At the same time, professional hierarchies had replaced social hierarchies with the makeup department. The gang of nationally integrated makeup men could turn any decent looking person into a hideous crimson hued monster with the help of truck loads of pancake and a number of other locally made potions and lotions. Underline these words in your textbook. You will find them in your textbook. How beautifully he is describing. Lot of humor in these lines. We all end up laughing when we read these lines. So, they are turning into crimson, hideous looking persons rather than naturally beautiful people. So, that was the work. But why? He will further explain why. Because there were no outdoor shootings. Most of the shootings were inside. Using humor, the author highlights the lack of finesse and also points out that the human eye sees things very differently than the camera. He also comments on the conditions and constraints on filmmaking at that time. You know, conditions were not very conducive. Maybe they did not have so much money and constraints were also there. How to take the whole crew for an outdoor shoot? That was rather difficult. Those were the days of mainly indoor shooting and only 5 percent of the film was shot outdoors. Suppose the sets and studio lights needed the girls and boys to be made to look ugly in order to look presentable in the movie. Now, that was the thing. Now, imagine this instead of looking beautiful, they were looking not so beautiful, but maybe in the camera. Now, satirizing the strict hierarchy, 
that was maintained in the makeup department. He writes, Ashok Mitran writes, the chief makeup man made the chief actors and actresses ugly. He is not writing beautiful. His senior assistant, the second hero and heroine, the junior assistant, the main comedian and so forth. The players who played the crowd were the responsibility of the office boy. Isn't it laughable? You know the office boy, even the makeup department had an office boy, whereas office boy is not required over there. So, this office boy would do the makeup of the crowd. People who were also often employed to run the errands, that was the office boy, but he was doing makeup for the crowd. And we will very soon come to know how he would do it. Even the makeup department of the Gemini studio had an office boy. On the days when there was a crowd shooting, you could see him mixing his paint in a giant vessel and slapping it on the crowd players. So, that was his technique of doing makeup. The author tries to make the job sound lofty by saying the idea was to close every pore on the surface of the face in the process of applying makeup. You see that should not be visible. So, that is why they used to really you know cake the face. With this he also underscores how menial the task really was. He also tells us this office boy was not a boy. Let us not look at him as a boy. He was not exactly a boy. He was in his early 40s. Having entered the studio years ago in the hope of becoming a star actor or a top screen writer, director or lyrics writer, but he really could not become any of these. So, he is still a, an office boy. He was a bit of a poet also. With this portrait, the author sheds light on the personal struggles and failed aspirations of the members of the film studio. Maybe this is true even today. Today also people go to film cities, film studios to become actors or to become producers and directors, but their hopes and aspirations are not fulfilled, but they stay in the system doing something or the other. It is poignant that those who create images and entertain so many of us have struggled to make their own dreams a reality. You see what we see on the screen is the hard work of many people behind the camera. We must realize that. Ashok Mitran then turns the spotlight on himself. He used to sit in a cubicle two whole sides of which were French windows. He writes, I did not know at that time they were called French windows. Seeing me sitting at my desk tearing up newspapers, day in and day out most people thought that I was doing next to nothing. So, have you understood what was Ashok Mitran's task? His task was to take down the cuttings from the newspapers and magazines about the films ok, about Gemini studio, about producers, about directors, about actors. So, he was keeping those cuttings, this was his duty to read it carefully and keep the cuttings in the file. It is likely that the boss thought likewise too, Ashok Mitran says that maybe the boss also thought like that, that he was simply sitting over there reading the newspaper and cutting the relevant news and keeping it in the files. So, anyone who felt I should be given some occupation would barge into my cubicle and deliver an extended lecture. The boy, you see, boy, do you remember the boy now? The office boy who was not actually a boy, he was in his early 40s. The boy in the makeup department had decided I should be enlightened on how great literary talent was being allowed to go waste. Whose talent? It is the office boy's talent because he had 
hopes that you know he would be recognized for his real talent and that was to be able to write poetry, to direct or to act. Since he went it often, the author began praying for crowd shooting so that he would go and this boy would do the makeup of the crowd and he would leave this place. Because Ashok Mitran could not stand him anymore, Ashok Mitran soon realized that he had become some sort of punching bag for the film studio. So, anybody and everybody who wanted to give vent to their feelings would come to Ashok Mitran and speak. Not only the makeup boy, but whenever frustrated others too would vent their anger on him openly or covertly. They must not have been a pleasant position to be in for sure. So, he realized that you know they were what difficulty were they going? It was not really pleasant for everybody over there, right? Everyone was struggling and he understood the real making of the film. We are then introduced to Kothamangalam Subbu. Subbu was number 2 at Gemini Studios. Now, before we begin with the second part which is about Kothamangalam Subbu, let us discuss a few questions. Are you ready for the questions? Now, these questions are based on the first part of the lesson. The first question is, what does the writer mean by the fiery misery of those subjected to makeup? We already know, you know, fiery misery, we discussed it. The makeup room of Gemini Studios looked like a hair cutting salon. It had around half a dozen mirrors with bright lights coming from all the angles. Art, the artist would feel the heat emanating from these lights. Thus, the writer uses the term fiery misery to denote the uncomfortable situation of those subjected to makeup. Second question, what is the example of national integration that the author refers to? You can go back to the first part of the text on page 58, 59 and you will find where he is talking about that in the makeup department there was a Bengali, a Maharashtrian, somebody from Karnataka, Andhra, Madras and also a person from Anglo-Burmese origin. So, therefore, we can say the makeup division of the Gemini Studios was an example of national integration. According to the author, this is so because people from different regions and religious groups work together in the same department. The department was headed by a Bengali who was succeeded by a Maharashtrian. The other helpers included a Dharwar Kanadiga, an Andhra, a Madras Indian Christian, an Anglo-Burmese and the local Tamils. So, this is clearly given in the text. So, we can really come to the conclusion that national integration was seen over there. There was space for everybody and they were all working together. Next question, what work did the office boy do in the Gemini studios? Why did he join the studios and why was he disappointed? So, we have discussed a lot about office boy. The office boy was responsible for the makeup of the people who formed part of the crowd and he was not a boy, he was a 40 year old person. He used to mix his paint in a giant vessel and slap the paint on the faces of the crowd players. He had joined the Gemini studios years ago aspiring to become an actor or a scriptwriter, or a director or a lyricist. He was disappointed with the studio that failed to recognize his talent. Why did the author appear to be doing nothing at the studios? His job was such, he was only supposed to cut the newspaper clippings, 
but other employees thought that he was doing nothing. He was only tearing papers which according to them did not qualify as work. I hope this much is clear to you. With this we have come to the end of this session. In the meantime you please read the text on your own. You will come across new words, try to gather their meaning from the context, otherwise refer to the dictionary. Happy reading, thank you.